Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Lisa Martin with Silver Spring Town Center, and we are so excited to present the search for oneness 50 years of spiritual art in the studio with artist Jamie Downs, who is one of our exceptional artists here in the DMV. I always love seeing her work, and I know you will too. I know many of you already are familiar with her B series and her beautiful flowers and and her, her abstract art, which is, I think, part of this um, Search for Oneness series. We'll learn more. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to tell you about some other exciting things Silver Spring Town Center has coming up. As you know, we're uh, a nonprofit, Silver Spring Town Center, situated in the Silver Spring Civic Building. We present well over 100 free arts and entertainment events through out the year and um we um including the silver spring blues festival but we also spotlight a different artist each month for december we have artist david amoroso presenting top of the pops and um, his work is very different, but also very exciting. And his presentation is actually this Thursday, December 1st at seven on Zoom. And I will put it in the chat if you'd like to sign up for that. He is at Artists and Makers this month and has an opening, opening night on Friday. That's why we scheduled him so early in December. We are also collaborating with Omni Theater and presenting um, behind the scenes or up close and personal with the stars of uh, Beauty and the Beast, the current production at Alney Theater. It was fantastic. We just saw it this weekend. I loved it. I'm a theater person, so, uh, but I think anyone would love it, including kids. It was fun for all ages and exceptional um, singing and story and acting. And so you can meet those stars on Tuesday, December 6th at the Silver Spring Civic Building at 7 p.m. We will be up close and personal and in person with the stars of Beauty and the Beast from Omni Theater. And then on Thursday, December 15th at 7 p.m. on Zoom, we are presenting another of our culinary traditions programs. We've done AAPI, African heritage, Latin American heritage, and now we're doing European traditions, culinary traditions. And we have an array of folks sharing their, sharing their uh, food uh, traditions and memories from all across the European continent. So join us on Thursday, December 15th. Today is also Giving Tuesday and SSTCI is a 501c3. So your tax deductible contribution of any amount is greatly appreciated. I will put a link in the chat, but you can also go to silverspringtowncenter.com and click contribute. And we are grateful for your support. And so let's get started with the program. The Search for Oneness, 50 Years of Spiritual Art in the Studio with Jamie Downs. Jamie received a BFA in painting from Kutz Univer Kutztown University uh, with further study at LaSalle and UMass and is taught at Drexel, Montgomery College, Georgetown, and currently at UDC. Um, her most recent series are floral archetypes, birds and animals. I also love her animals, they're so cute. And digital paintings with diverse content. Jamie work, has worked in mixed media, non-objective painting for over 50 years, exploring themes of oneness. Her studio is in North Kensington, by appointment, and I know she's actually even hosting an event in her studio on uh, the, Saturday, the 18th, so she'll tell you more about that. So without further ado, let's let's have uh, Jamie take, take mm -hmm. it away. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. Yeah, I wish I knew Zoom better so I could like, you know, put the gel on my, on my <laughs> studio so you didn't see the mess behind it, but um, and also, I'm glad I have a PowerPoint because I, I'm in the middle of dental work, so I'm, I'm trying to get over my vanity here. 
Um, but um, yes, I, we are having an event on December 18th. Um, Sandra Perez Ramos, Laura Lee, um, I knew I would do this. Um, Laura Lee Palmer, Alexandra Slezak, Gwen Mazaro and I. And um, it just kind of has grown. And it's going to be right here at my studio, which um, is 11713 Hatcher Place in North Kensington. And the reason I didn't clean up my studio was because I was making this poster, this sandwich board for it all day today and got caught up doing that. So, um, but that's going to be on December 18th from 12 to 6. So if, if you live in the area and you want to stop by, um, it should be fun. We're going to get together the night before and I think have a bonfire and make cookies. So we'll have goodies um, for people to enjoy. So anyway, I think the way I'll do this, um, it's 54 years, I think I was trying to figure out today. Um, I think the way I'll do this is to, um, my work is so informed by what's happened in my life. Um, and consistently, I don't consider, I probably should, but I don't consider all of my art spiritual. And I think it just is in a different way, probably than, than the oneness series, which is what I've done most of my life, uh, and still continue to do. Um, but, and I'll explain to you how it's led to other things, but, um, since the work is informed by life events, I thought that I would do a PowerPoint, um, that kind of just does the whole bio of, of what has happened in my life and how my art has, has um, been affected by it and, and progressed through it. And, um, and probably there aren't too many of you. So probably um, we should probably hold questions till the end, but if you have a question that's like really, cause, cause I'm old and it's a long life to talk about, but um, if you have a question that like is that you really want to ask at the time, um, you can put it in the chat and then Lisa will let us know that there's a question. Uh, and otherwise, um, hopefully I will get through this um, in enough time that we have time in the end for, for questions. And it doesn't look like I see Susan, I see other friends in there. Um, it doesn't look like there are people from these parts of my life that have that have registered and joined. But if any of them do and, and they want to contribute and say something about things, um, you know, please speak up um, in a chat or whatever, and um, and you can you can join in the conversation. So that's what I'll do. I'll I'll go to the PowerPoint that I won't have to look at myself. Um, and let's see, share screen. I'm used to using collaborate, which is very similar, not as sophisticated as Zoom, I think. Um, I'm used to using that to to teach. Uh, what do I want to do? Oh, the mute button is in the way. Slideshow. Um, I got to move it so I can see. There we go. Play from start. Okay. So can you see it all now? Um, you can see the, the, okay. So that's me probably around 70 some years ago, like 60 some years ago, um, drawing. So, you know, I've always um, been um, very involved in art. Um, it's just always been something that I do. So, um, and this piece on the, on the right, um, I'll talk about, but I thought it was a good thing for a cover photo. So this was a show um, who, that I had, uh, several years ago with COVID, I've sort of lost track of time, but a couple of years ago at Artists and Makers in Rockville. And it was kind of a retrospective um, and it was um, 50 years at that time um, instead of 54, I guess, as it is now. And if, if you look at the images, I don't know if you can see them all. Um, the ones on the bottom right were like college time the big orange and blue one and the two um, with the with the red orange areas in them and the white the little white ovals. They were done in college actually. And I think the blue and orange one was either right in or right after college. Um, 
and there are things here that were in the 80s and the 90s and um just you know from from about 19 i went to school in 68 graduated in 72 so those were done around that time and uh, i used to have a storage space and had the work arranged by decade so it was easy to find but uh, at any rate this this is kind of a um a panorama of of just the oneness series um which i consider the most spiritual of of the art that i do um right after college the the I wonder if I can move them. Ah, I can. The um the stuff from Zoom is in the way that I'm from what I'm seeing. Right after college, um, and that's me at about 26, I guess. Um, I was a newspaper photographer. So photography, even though I don't show my work very much as a photographer, uh, photography's always been something that I did consistently. Um, as the family knows, and my Flickr page goes on forever and ever and ever, um, even if I don't show it. But I and I was a photojournalist um, for two newspapers in central Pennsylvania, and then I was a stringer for a newspaper in the Philadelphia area for a while. So photography has been a part of it from from the very beginning. Um, not so much the oneness series, but um, my my other art that's that more recent art definitely been an outgrowth of, of the photography. Um, then um, my husband and I had a, oops, I went too far. My husband and I had a, a folk music magazine for several years um, in the 70s um, into the, close to the 80s. And uh, that was while I was a newspaper photographer. So I had access to all the equipment to do it. And so um, the magazine was called The Folk Life, and we just went to all kinds of folk festivals. We lived at folk festivals in the summertime, and um, we published this magazine monthly, and then we went to quarterly right before we stopped doing it. Um, so um, my husband's yelling in the background. I hope you can't hear him. Um, so anyway, sciatica, I think. Um, so anyway, this is the... Um, Hold on one second. I don't know how to to mute. Okay, well he realizes it now. Um, anyway, so this is uh, John Hartford on the left hand side and the Greengrass Cloggers on the right hand side. John Hartford passed away several years ago, but we're still in touch with some of the Greengrass Cloggers, um, and uh, you know lifelong friendships. But again, a lot of photography. So the Folk Life magazine had a lot of photo spreads. Um, and uh, at the bottom right there, if you can see it, is my husband and my daughter and I at that point in time when we were doing the Folk Life magazine. Um, so if, if anybody's interested, it's the Greengrass Cloggers, Eugene O'Donnell's a Celtic fiddler, that's Odetta, and then John Jackson um, was a blues singer. These are the hands of Cal O'Connell from um, The Boys of the Lock, another John Hartford. This was Robin Williamson. Those old hippies would remember the incredible string band. Um, this is Robin Williamson and Chris. I can't remember Chris's last name from the band that he had at the time called the Mary Band. Um, and yeah, so so that was something that that took a lot of our life. I mean, we it, this was at the time of you know hand type labels and and um, you know a lot of mail sorting to mail out once a month to people all over the place. But that um, I was painting at the same time, but um, I was also a photojournalist at the same time. So and and had little kids at the same time. So it was kind of a busy a busy time. This is very sensitive. Okay, there. Okay, so this is um, the nineteen eighties. In the 1980s, Helen Frankenthaler, for those of you who know the, she was like sort of a late abstract expressionist. I, I saw a show of hers in New York and she was very much into um, iridescent acrylics that, that came out about the 1980s. So my work in the 1980s had a lot of iridescent acrylic and I actually still use a lot of metallics and iridescence in my work. Um, this piece was, it's huge. Um, it's a triptych and I think each of the three 
panels are maybe five feet by six feet or something. They're, they're really big and they're hinged. Um, and then at the bottom left is a friend of mine, an artist and a Tai Chi master, Marilyn Cooper. And you can see in the original version of this, there was a diptych there in the bottom that was, and it closed around that. And then there were soft sculptures and stuff to sort of ease it to the ground. So that was something that I had done um, in the 80s. Uh, so here are more 80s works that were really a lot of iridescent, uh, iridescent um, acrylics for the most part. Um, and I guess, yeah, there's some iridescent. I didn't realize I was using iridescent oil pastels that early, but I guess I was. Um, these, um, this, the one, the, the pinkish one is four feet by four feet. Um, the two at the top are, I don't know, a standard watercolor size paper, maybe, maybe 20 something by 30 or something like that. And then the one at the bottom is, um, 36 by 36. I seem to always work. I feel most comfortable with square. It, it, I don't always work square, but I almost always work square. Uh, even when I'm like cropping photographs, I end up cropping them to square, which makes it really hard to frame. Um, but, um, and also not usual sizes, but um, I think that comes from being a photojournalist and when you crop the photographs to what works as a photograph, not to necessarily to the size, and then you fit it to the column inch. Um, I, that just takes precedence to me over standard sizes. In, uh, this was in the 1990s. In the 1990s, both my parents died of cancer in the 1990s. It was kind of a, a rough time, um, you know, seeing them both through it and spending a lot of time um, caring for them at their house. So um, I think this was after they had both passed away. I did a series called Ancestors and River Rocks um, with a friend from Ghana, Maxwell Doncor. Um, and Maxwell um, is an amazing artist, um, African sculpture and printmaking. And I mean, he does everything. And he's a drummer and a dancer. And um, but at any rate, we had a show together, a two person show at a gallery that I was in in the in the Poconos. And so we did this work, this show called Ancestors and River Rocks. So my my parents are from central Pennsylvania. Um, I just discovered recently, my mother's family was there since the 1600s. So um, I, I really feel a connection to that land. And it's not really river rocks, it's more creek rocks, but um, I just feel a real connection to the land there. And um, so the ancestors thing was, Maxwell's was doing ancestral work and, and mine was ancestors too, but I was, it was also the land. Um, and the and the creek and the and the rocks and so on. That, that this series, this piece on the left is huge. Um, it's, I guess it's it's more than six feet. Um, yeah, it feels mo. It's probably about. It's probably about six, a little more than six feet high, and maybe eight feet or so wide. It's long. It fills a whole wall in my daughter's house right now. So it's 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 pretty big, and. Um, it's mixed media with um, a lot of uh, paint stick. I was using a lot of paint stick and it looks like there's a lot of Sennelier oil pastel in that too, the iridescent turquoise colors. I use a lot of that, I just love it. It never really dries completely, but it hardens. And um, you have to remember to use it last when you're doing mixed media because it's oil-based. So, um, you know, you can't really put any water-based stuff on top of it, but I do that in, I finish almost every painting with that. It's just creamy, really nice stuff. So in the 1980s, late 1980s, um, I was living in the Poconos and I was the president of the Arts Council there. And I was asked to put together a, a program and, we were focusing, it was a general for the general public, but we were focusing on kids who were like getting kicked out of summer camps, who, who couldn't really do it, regular summer camps. Um, and um, so we were asked to take those kids and we got money from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts and from Mental Health, Mental Retardation Services and Children and Youth. And we started summer camps. 
Um, and it went on for 10 years and it grew from summer camp and after school programs into um, full-time after school programs that switched to full-time daytime. If the schools were off, we had 28,000 square foot building. Um, let's see, don't wanna miss anything here. We had, um, we worked with Head Start. Um, we got a grant from Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Planning Council to put kids together with disabilities and without disabilities in a situation where lifelong friendships might develop. And it's worked. They're friends on Facebook now, a lot of them. Um, so that was really nice. And then after seven years, we were asked to expand the program uh, and accept Medicaid funding which probably was a mistake and yet I'd probably do it again. Um, and so we really expanded to this 28,000 square foot building and 28 full-time staff people. Um, most of them were artists. And we had kids coming from the general public and we had about 60 kids coming to us from the different agencies. We never distinguished who, nobody knew who was who. Um, except the staff. Um, in the first seven years, we didn't even know who was who for the most part. But then after we got Medicaid money, we had so much paperwork, we we began to know the kids' histories, which we had never known before. Um, and so, you know, we knew who was who, but uh, the general public didn't. And people usually guessed wrong. Um, so this was one of our summer camp programs um, that you're seeing along the outside. This was the outside of our building that an artist named Steve Linden and some of the kids did this found object piece that took the whole outside of the building with had working television sets in it. It was crazy. Um, and we had we had wonderful stuff. We had uh, well, we had Maxwell and we had a number of other people. Um, we had music and computer music. We had a library and uh, writing and reading programs. We had paper making, photography, printmaking, um, black um, metalwork, um, regular regular art, uh, digital art. We taught Adobe programs and the programs that were um, known at that time. So we did a lot of computer art. This was in the mid nineties. And uh, so it was It was great. And the kids could choose whatever they wanted to do. They could go from artist to artist. Um, we end, it was, the Poconos is a really big jazz community. Um, so we did a lot of jazz programs. We had a lot of classes for the general public. Um, we did a lot of um, collaborative programs with um, Area Agency on Aging. We worked in senior centers and uh, with Head Start. Um, you know, I mean, we, we were doing all kinds of stuff. Um, the bottom right there was the high school music teacher at the time, and that's George Young, who you might recognize if you watch Saturday Night Live back then. He was a saxophone player in Saturday Night Live, and he was married to my friend Marilyn that I just showed you. Um, and so they did um, some some programs for us and wrote some original music. Um, so it was it was really a great program, and it went on for ten years. And then Medicaid, we had different government in Harrisburg. Medicaid funding was cut. By this time, we had an arts alternative school, but we hadn't reached the point yet where we diversified enough that we could make it without the Medicaid funding. And we ended up closing, which was kind of a disaster um, because the kids were without a program. Um, and we'd had a lot of them for all ten for ten years, so it. But it was it was pretty amazing. Um, and uh, there's a artist named Bill Cleveland uh, who lives out in Oregon now, and he talks about art as cold fusion. Um, we don't know why it works; it just does. It's it just is a great equalizer, and it's we never had any problems with these kids, which is why we ended up having an arts alternative school for the kids who couldn't go to regular public schools and we had no problem with them. So they came to us. So um, it was great. It was a great 10 years, but it was a, it was a difficult ending. Um, so after it ended, that was about the time my husband retired. We did some traveling, so more photography. Uh, on the bottom right, if you can see it is a, a digital piece. So um, I started, 
because I was doing a lot of Adobe stuff and teaching it in the program, I was always doing computer work and the photography led to sort of more digital work, um, which I wasn't showing at the time for quite a while, but just doing for fun. And so that's a piece from like our travels to, to uh, Oaxaca after my husband retired. And we happened to be there just at the right time when um, the Zapatistas were marching. Um, and uh, it was it was crazy, but I kind of went into photojournalist mode. And, and um, uh, so it wasn't so much this. Well, I did do actually with a friend, I did, I did do a, um, uh, a piece based on this that first photograph, um, but for the most part, it, it wasn't this kind of work that that turned into paintings. Um, it was more, you know, floral floral works. So by this time, we moved down here. Um, two thousand three, I think we moved down here, and I was pretty devastated from a family of artists closing, and um, I just couldn't access that place that the paintings, that the spiritual paintings, the oneness paintings were coming from. I, it just wasn't there. I just couldn't do it. And and um, so um, my husband had, I guess, suggested Meister Eckhart to me. He's a medievalist. And I was reading um, translated works of, of Meister Eckhart and they're just these great phrases. So I started like writing the phrases. The, these are all uh, two foot by two foot, 24 by 24 masonite panels and it's oil. Um, the, they're all, I think they're mostly in oil. There might be some mixed media because I don't think that gold is oil. Um, but uh, I started like just writing the phrases from Meister Eckhart. Um, and for the most part, the, I mean, the phrases may, have, may get obscured as I paint or they might still be there. Um, so this is a number of, of pieces from that series, which I think I may go back to and and do again. Um, I was looking to see if I had. No, nope. um, anyway, I was going to give you the names of them, but they're things like enjoy and um, giving birth, um, just different phrases like that um, from Meister Eckhart. And interestingly enough, I was at DC Art Studios in Tacoma Park at the time. And there were two other artists there at the time doing a Meister Eckhart series. Um, and uh, Thomas Block and uh, Kiki McGrath. And um, Thomas Block, I think, has moved to New York. but And Kiki moved to Italy, but she's back now, I think. And... It, it's just funny that we were both, we were all three doing Meister Eckhart series in Tacoma Park at that time. Our work was very, very different. Um, we, we all, you know, treated it very differently, but um, um, that was just a real coincidence. So the working in Photoshop and taking photographs at botanical gardens and things like that, um, this work was just easier to do. I it was much easier to do than 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 the oneness series because I I was just having so much difficulty getting the space in my head to do that. Um, I know it doesn't seem like that would be easier to a lot of people or that would be harder to a lot of people than this, but it is. It's um, it's the difference between painting and searching. I think searching is so much a part of of the other work that. Um, it's it's like sort of a meditative experience, and you have your head has to be in the right place to do it. Whereas with this, it was you know I had the photographs and I played with them in on the computer, and I and I did digital pieces, and then if I liked the digital piece, it was like oh I think I'll paint that. So um, that was just much easier to do. And I I guess I'd gone like fifty years from college without ever doing representational work. And all of a sudden I started doing representational work and I've been doing it ever since. Um, and this was the first of it, I think. I think I might've started with that trip to Mexico and some of the, some of the flowers there. Um, these, of course, for those of you who live around here, the lotuses from Kenilworth, um, the um, aquatic gardens. And um, a lot of it is this, oh, actually, I think this orchid was from back when Kensington orchid existed. Um, it's no longer there in Kensington. 
And I think the uh, the bleeding hearts and the iris are from, from my front yard. So then when I was a kid, I was like totally obsessed with birds and like kindergarten age. And I have a, a 1953 calendar um, of birds that I remember drawing from when I was really little drawing the birds. And then I hadn't drawn birds, you know, since probably elementary school. And I, I just thought, well, I wonder what like 40 years of abstract expressionist art would do to birds um, if, I, if I started doing birds. And, and I really have applied all of what I learned from doing non-objective art in doing this. There's a lot of color field in the backgrounds of my paintings. I was never a color field painter, but I had a lot of friends who were, and I was influenced by that. So that's kind of where the backgrounds come from in a lot of these. If you look around the, the outside edge, you'll see like the history of the colors that were there as I, as I worked on it, which is a, like a color field thing. So I only work for my own photographs. Um, you know, I have friends who like buy Getty photos and, and use them, which is perfectly legit, but I, I don't do that. I only work for my own. So I have to have had, a, you know, I had to get a good photo of something before I could do a painting from it. And not always, but often they're digital first and then they become, um, then they become, if I like them, then they become a, a painting. Um, almost all of these are, are 24 by 24. The owl isn't. Um, and the, um, the cardinal at the, um, the second from the left is 30 by 30, I think. And the rest are all 24 by 24. They're all mixed media. Um, starting out with maybe even pencils or watercolor or Caran d'Ache or, um, something like that at the beginning and then going to acrylic and then probably ending with Sennelier oil pastels. And I had grandchildren that I share with Susan and, um, and, and some others and that meant a lot of zoo trips. And so I had a lot of photographs of animals. So I'm not sure what led me to do it, but I decided I was gonna do a series. I was gonna try to do the whole alphabet in animals. Um, and um, the top right is, um, or my son did a movie. This is Susan's son-in-law, um, did a, a feature length movie. And in it, there was, uh, it was called, it's called Cold, Cold Wars. If you want to rent it, um, you can rent it almost anywhere. Um, it's not the black and white, um, I think it's a Polish movie, the Cold Wars it was out at the same time, um, but um, it's a it's a sort of a dark comedy. That's uh, really fun. And they have um, raccoon flu in it. So I did that painting um, for them and for him for the for the movie of the raccoon. Um, I did a whole monkey series. Um, so the spider monkey and um, the, I think they're Tsetse monkeys. Um, this may be Bow Bow, the bottom left, I'm not sure. It's one of the Washington um, um, pandas. Um, but that was kind of fun to do. And uh, I think it's run its course, but who knows? I, I may go back and do more um, animal things at some other point. So the one this series, that's, that's just, that's continued. So these are more recent pictures. In the in the oneness series, more recent paintings. Um, this one might be when I I don't have any images of it unless this is one on the left. Um, I had fifteen years ago. I was just talking to to Lisa about it before we started. Fifteen years ago, I had I had uh, triple negative breast cancer, so I had chemotherapy for like a year or better, and uh, so I told myself I was going to do a painting at each session, and I did do a painting at each one. But that that's it's not normal for me to do a painting that quickly. So they're mostly studies. I still have them all, but I haven't really developed them into full paintings. Uh, but I think the one on the left is one of those. Um, and um, it's fairly large on this beautiful canvas, masonite and canvas thing that probably cost a fortune, but somebody at DC Art Studios gave it to me. It's a wonderful canvas. Um, and uh, the one on the right, 
I was teaching at PG County in their continuing education program, and they asked me to teach them how to paint with tissue paper, which I didn't really want to do. I thought it was kind of old fashioned. Oops. Um, but I did, and it was fun. And so I did a couple of paintings in the early 2000s that um, that had, um, I think there's there's some mediums in there, glass bead medium, and there's may, might be some mica medium in there, and tissue paper and all kinds of, of mixed media. So that was kind of fun to do. I think I'm going through this faster than I thought I would. Um, another series that I did recently because of going to Kenilworth, I think, um, was a, a series of um, water lily paintings. And uh, that was kind of fun. I may, I may do more of those. I haven't made it to Kenilworth the last couple of years. July is the best time to go, if you're wondering, um, because that's when the lotus are all in bloom. Um, but um, these are not lotus. I, I do have a bunch of lotus paintings somewhere, but these are um, uh, water lilies that I did. I, I often, I usually work in series. I think it's left over from college days when you know we were told that um real artists do one thing and they do it in series and that's that's how you're a real artist and i think i was influenced by that forever um until i was like 50 and i finally gave myself permission to do something other than that one thing but i still love that one thing the most and that's the oneness the oneness stuff the oneness series So um, also in the early 2000s, I guess, um, uh, going back about 15 years, but um, um, my husband was, was pretty sick. And one year he was in the hospital like 50 times. So I spent a whole lot of time sitting in a hospital room um, and not in my studio, but I had my computer. So I thought, you know, this was before I was teaching, I think, and I thought, well, I got to do something to make some income here. So I'm going to do color books and turn all my photographs into line drawings. And then I'm going to I'm going to do color books, which I have not completed. I've done a couple, um, but I haven't published them. Um, but it turned out that my line drawings were so complicated. I thought, how is anybody ever going to color these? They're not going to know what to color. So I decided I had to do little thumbnails of each one um, to give people ideas and to show what's leaf and what's what's plant and what's flower. Um, so I ended up doing the line drawings, but then I did um, what ended up being limited edition prints of them in color, all of this digitally. Um, and so now I have a lot of, I think that that year I did like 80 of them maybe. Um, and I've been doing them since I haven't counted, um, but um, I have a lot of digital pieces. Um, so I, I print them on my own, not so great, but it, it does great printing, but it's it's horrible with feeding um, on, on rag paper in my own little um, inexpensive Epson um, large format. Um, printer that does up to 13 by 19. So I do them in, thir as in 13 by 19 and then and mount them. And I usually have them in um, portfolios at the galleries. Um, I'm in the Wheaton Gallery in the Wheaton Mall. Um, I'm there now. I hadn't been there for a while, but I was there for quite a while. And, at, and Gallery 209 at Artists and Makers. And so in the portfolios, I have a lot of the digital pieces. It's taken people a while to adjust to digital art and kind of accept it as legit. Um, sometimes it's not allowed on the walls. I think people are getting over that and you can put digital work on the walls now um, and not just in the portfolios, but um, it's, uh, I, I don't know, I guess it's been seen as lesser for a while, unless you're in graphic design or something, but I think it's, I think we're getting over that. Um, so at any rate, these are some of the limited edition prints that I've done. And you can see, I think, yeah, I think those are prints at the top left. Um, they're like 13 by 19 uh, prints that I've printed on my printer and, and mounted and, and then put in bags. Um, I haven't printed all of these yet. I think I've printed the, the, um, the top, the middle two on the top. I haven't printed the top right one 
uh, yet or the bottom left. I need to do some printing. Uh, and I printed the bottom right one too. Um, if you do Fine Art America and stuff, they do a really good job of, of doing not only note cards, but also like pillows and things like that. Um, so some of this work is I've, I've done in that way. And, um, and Spoonflower, this is another digital um, choice that, that you have. If you have work that you've either photographed or that it's digital that you can upload, Spoonflower does fabric. And um, so I started playing around in Photoshop with drawings and paintings and flipping them around and doing kind of a kaleidoscopic thing with them and doing some fabric designs. I have to go further with that because, because you have to proof it to make sure that the run, that the repetitions are right. Um, you have to buy them before you can put them up for sale and, and, and check them. And so that's a process I haven't totally gone through yet. But, um, and Spoonflower at one point in time did these really cool, you could even get furniture and wallpaper and all kinds of stuff from your images as well as fabric. And they would even make, if you uploaded a program or, or a pattern or chose a pattern, they would even make the clothing for you. I don't think they do all that anymore, but they still do a lot, fabric and, and wallpaper and things like that. So that I may pursue um, doing some more. This is some of the stuff that I've done with the digital work. There's some pillows and note cards. And um, so, you know, that's something I might pursue. I'm doing a lot of teaching right now, but I keep thinking this is an alternative way of maybe making some money um, if I can't teach. Um, but I don't intend to quit anytime, recent, or anytime soon because I'm really enjoying that. I teach at UDC. I haven't taught at Georgetown though, um, but um, I'm um, at, at UDC and at... Um, um, you know, the other schools that, that Lisa mentioned. Um, and I, I'm only teaching at UDC now, and I really love teaching there. It's a great school, and I'm teaching art majors, so so that's a lot of fun. I get I somehow got pigeonholed into teaching computer art. I'd much rather be teaching painting, but, um, but I'm teaching computer art and color theory, and um, Every once in a while, I get to teach uh, computer illustration, which is really fun to teach. And um, every once in a while, I've gotten to teach something like painting um, or, and, and even advanced painting once, which was really fun to do. So this takes me up to COVID. Um, and during COVID, I, I decided that I would not call it isolation. I would call it an artist in residency. And I would just spend my time at home painting. <laughs> It was an enforced artist in residency. So um, I got a, I think this was my son's suggestion. I got um, at Unique Thrift, uh, an old like Canon lens for a regular Canon camera, pre-digital. And if you get an adapter and you put it on a digital camera, it does really interesting things. So this is a, tele I used a telephoto lens and it didn't really, it was supposed to be in like an 80 to 200 zoom or something, but it really only worked at like 10 feet away with a really, really, really narrow depth of field. So, you know, you'd be photographing a flower and one pedal would be in focus and the rest would not. So I, I ended up taking photographs out my front window of my bee bomb and the bees on my bee bomb and, and, and had that really narrow depth of field where everything just kind of disappeared, um, you know, after a couple inches into really neat light patterns and things like that. So I started doing these bee paintings and um, I've sold a lot of the bee paintings and kind of unfortunately and unfortunately, because some of my favorites, I think my favorite one is this one, the third one in is my favorite one. Um, and um, you can see that I guess at the Wheaton Mall, they have, you know how they have artwork in the tables and the food court. And I, I sat down at a table this week and that painting was on the table because the uh, Wheaton Arts Parade was, was putting artwork on the tables in the food court. Um, so I did a B series and I'm probably not done with that because I still have Bee Bomb outside my window and I go to Brookside Gardens a lot. I'm thinking my next series is gonna be all Brookside Gardens paintings. Um, but um, 
there's a lot of bees at Brookside Gardens too. So as I'm photographing the flowers there, I get a lot of bee, um, bee shots. And um, so I'm probably not done with this series. Um, also outside my other window were irises. So I did a lot of iris paintings and um, it, it's really neat when, when irises are wet after a rain, um, they're not just white, um, you know, and, and all like blown out from the sun, but you see all of the stuff inside the, the, um, the petals. And um, so that was really fun to paint the irises after a rain. Um, the one on the left is 20, is, is 36 by 48. It's, it's pretty big. Um, I've just, af I used to work big and I'm thinking I want to work big again. I mean, really big, but um, it's just so much easier to work 24 by 24. They're so much easier to store and stack. Storage is really a problem when you work big. Um, so, uh, so most of my paintings are 24 by 24 now. Um, although I, I have a lot of paper and I decided I was just going to work on paper too. So uh, we'll see what size they are, but they'll probably be square, but I, I don't know what size they'll be. Um, going to Brookside Gardens almost every day on walks. Um, not so much this year. I don't know where they were this year, but last year there were great blue herons there a lot. And I got so many photographs of the great blue herons that I ended up doing a heron a heron ser series, which I I might do more of, especially if there are herons there next year. Uh, I think there was too much algae or something for them this year; they just weren't there. But um, but last year they were there all the time, and I and I got a lot of photographs. These are all um, mixed media on canvas. Um, I use a lot of um, metallic silkscreen ink, um, which is an acrylic base thing. Um, and that's where the metallics come from. I, I just really love metallics. Um, so, and I also use like the acrylic inks that are iridescent. So that's the turquoises and stuff there. Um, and uh, and then I, actually, I don't see Sennelier oil pastel on these. Um, so I guess the metallics were enough. I'm sure there must be on the on the one on the right. There must be some oil pastel. I have to look at them to see. So that's I think my most recent series. Um, and that's that's it. So um, I guess we have time for questions. If I can figure out how to stop sharing. Okay. In well, teaching. Yeah, okay. So I thought that gives you a context. And um, because it all kind of, you know, everything happens for a reason, and it all kinds of builds to, you know, it just, it makes you who you are. And the artwork comes out of that. So, um, so I don't know if how many of you are artists, or and how many of you live around here. Yeah, okay, almost all artists. So, so you yeah. may questions then about we have a few artists on the call including SSTCI board member Madeline Caliendo um our art salon host Camilla Bryce Laporte who is a doll artist and wonderful cultural programmer who hosts our next art salon in January we also have artist Sharon Lee Minor aka Auntie Africa and I just posted her um info in the chat for her her program will be foo foo for the eyeballs mm. foo foo for the eyeballs in the studio with sharon lee minor january 12th so check it out and sign up good and and so you also have an old friend who's joined us who's active in ssdci programs lives in philadelphia saul brody oh, yeah in, saul in, in the folk life days yes he's a big folk music person so mm -hmm. wonderful um, musician. I so was just maybe, looking at pictures of him this week with Steve Goodman I think you were posting them on Facebook great yeah so is there anyone who would like to ask Jamie a question or make a comment we can bring you on 
Uh, you know, I love all of your work. I that bee, the bee <laughs> painting is my favorite one with the little bee hovering. Over. That's my favorite too. I'm sorry I sold it. <laughs> she had such a great, uh, or he had a personality. Are they? Bees are all male, right? The ones who are pollinating. I don't know. I should know. I should know more about them. I just right. appreciate them. Yeah. Anybody Hi, know? Jamie. Hi, Jamie. This is Camila. I love your work. It's oh, really beautiful, you. really beautiful work. And I'm often in Brookside also. So maybe one day we'll meet each other. But how we'll would you, each other. wouldn't that be great? Um, how would you recommend a person, you know, for someone who's interested in digital, making that transition from painting to digital, how would you begin? And where would you start? Um, what, where would you take classes? Where would you take classes? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that one. I think, I don't know if like how much it, it costs to just take a class at like UDC where I teach. Um, and Montgomery College also has um, a lot of classes in, in um, computer art. The thing I like about UDC is that it's geared towards studio art more than graphic design, although I teach in graphic illustration too, and that's geared towards um, graphic design, but there's a lot of studio art majors that are required to take the computer classes. And so it's interesting to handle it from more of a studio art perspective. Um, but where I, I, I do you do photography as well? Because I'm an amateur photographer. You can't be in Brookside and not be an amateur well, photographer. Well, that's true. Yeah. yeah you have to. <laughs> Um, and also, and also Kenilworth is another, you know, I like getting out. Yeah. Um, Catoctin oh. is another one that's beautiful too. Yeah. I'm not sure where to go there, but um, yeah, I, what I tell my students and one of the projects that I give them to do is to take a photograph, um, either something they've already taken or something that they stage and take and turn it into a painting. And um this helps students too, who, who also feel that they're not very good at drawing. Um, if they take an original photograph and they bring it into Photoshop on a layer and then um, put a layer on top of it and paint on top of it. And the first thing that I tell them to do is to simplify, to just get rid of all the extraneous stuff that you don't want and simplify the photograph down to the core important part of the photograph. Um, and paint out the rest. And um, the nice thing about digital is that you can zoom in real tight and get real close into the detail in a work and paint it. And then when you zoom back out to regular size, it's, you know, it's there and the detail is all there. I have a student who wants to take computer art with me next semester and he likes to do Japanese armor and things like that and chain mail and things. And I'm saying, oh, that'll be much easier digitally because you can zoom in to all that detail and paint it. But I think it's because I'm so stubbornly a painter that I, I instead of using all the bells and whistles and filters and stuff, which I have to teach, but for my own work, um, I just mostly use the paint brushes and paint in digitally. Um, and- Oh, your work is beautiful. It's, oh, okay. it's just exceptional, really, really good. Well, thank you. I guess I've just been doing it for so long. But, um, but I think that's that's a good way to start is to import a, learn how to import a photograph into Photoshop. And, and people now are using, it's, it's a program that's, that's actually rivaling Photoshop and it's much cheaper. And I haven't, it's only available on iPad, I think. And um, it's called Procreate. And I think it's only like 13 or $18 or something. Whereas Photoshop will cost you, if you get the, all the Adobe programs, it's like $29, $39 a month or something. Um, but um, Procreate, you just buy once and it's very sophisticated if you like to work on a tablet. Uh, and a lot of my students do that because they don't wanna buy a computer and they use a tablet. Um, and for illustration, I allow them to use, use that. For computer art, we have to use Adobe programs, but because they're the industry standard, but um, but that's what I would recommend. Um, yeah, importing, a, learning to import a photograph into Photoshop and then just paint it 
um, you know, with the paint brushes and, um, and start from that. So. Okay. Great suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we have Grace saying my husband uses Procreate and does amazing, uh, amazing and diverse things like what you showed when you spoke of fabric work. Yeah, that fabric transforming your art into fabric was just so cool and you you mentioned the website people were curious about spoon flower which i've heard of yeah it's it was fun because actually that the, my favorite of the fabric ones um was like orange and purple and it was actually a, a, a colored pencil drawing of a tiger lily but mm -hmm. it's it's hard to find the tiger lily in it now, but I just, you know, just flipped it around, just kept flipping it and flipping it and flipping it, which is also easy to do in Photoshop. Um, and uh, I recommend Photoshop rather than Illustrator unless your mindset is different and you're an Illustrator person. Um, but for painters, I would think Photoshop or Procreate um, would be what you'd want to do. But right. Anyway, yeah, Spoonflower is pretty neat. I need to pursue it and do more, I think. I've only printed out a couple of things, which I sent Susan to Nika, but um, those are the only things I've ever printed at, uh, from them. But but I have like 80 different fabric designs up that I need to pursue. My daughter thinks we should make them all into moo -moos. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they would be, that would be great, yeah. 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 Um, Beach towels could be cool. Curtains. I mean, all kinds mm -hmm. of. Creative. I have a friend, Eleanor. Bags. Yeah, Eleanor Dix or Eleanor Burdenshaw. She goes by both names. Um, and she's lived. She lived in Kensington. She's lived all around here, but now she lives in Nashville. And she's um, she's done a lot of the costume designing for plays around here. Mm -hmm. um, and she's a wonderful costume designer. So she and I had talked about like she would design um, design stuff and use my fabrics. And she said, we need to find a an interior decorator and offer them like, you know, the sole rights to designs and then use them for household things, you know, drapes and upholstery and, and stuff like that. Um, right. Do it through. And she's like, she can make them all. I mean, she can make the clothing too. And I have another friend in Baltimore who wants me to, to do paisley designs mm. uh, and do kind of 60s style clothing and paisley designs. And um, Eleanor has said, yeah, I can I can, I can can make up those patterns and, and sew them too if you make the fabric. So we'll see. We'll see if anything comes of it. But I got obsessed with doing all these paisley designs for a while. Too Dang. many things to get obsessed in. Well, we, we have a question. We have someone with their hand up. It's um, Sharon, artist Sharon Lee Miner, who's our January featured artist. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Hello. Hello. Jamie, Hi. I love your work. Uh, it's Hi. And very inspiring. I, my question is, are you familiar with uh, the Washington Lab School? The what? I mean, the color school, the Washington Color School, or the Washington Lab School. It's no. the Washington Lab School. What? What I brought it up is because when you were working with the students, special students, mm -hmm. and uh, you said about the Medicaid that you were working with mm -hmm. students like that, and I can imagine that was traumatic, just working with the Medicaid forms. Right. Uh, so um, all that paperwork every day. Oh my, Crazy. Okay. But I was also wondering, did you do any uh, research or were you doing or did anyone do any research on the, 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 pro the progress that you were doing with those students? Um, well, we did it for 10 years. So we had a lot of evidence of progress. Okay. Um, we had students who, who just couldn't deal with the public schools um, and they were fine with us. Um, they at one because we had contracts with MHMR and children and youth, we were required to have like a timeout room, like a padded room kind of thing. We never used it. It ended up being like the trombone practice room. And um, an artist, Steve Linden, who worked with us at the time, who's an amazing artist, you should Google him. Um, he did the, the, the piece on the front of the building. Um, he was making um, kaleidoscopes, giant kaleidoscopes with like sneakers in them, all kinds of stuff inside the old one to Ripley's Believe It or Not. And the quote quiet room had a had a um, a glass like 
uh, you know, those cubes uh, window at the end of it. And so there was light. And so he had a kaleidoscope in there that filled the whole room. So it was our trombone practice room or our kaleidoscope room. We never needed it, um, except we had like a girl with multiple, some of the chemical stuff that you just, you know, behavioral doesn't control. Um, but very rarely did we have any issues with kids at all. And um, to, much to everyone's amazement. And that's why we ended up having an arts alternative school because we ended up with eight kids that just couldn't go back to public school and they could come to us. So, so we had them. It was, but what I did think about doing very seriously was um, doing a pro after, um, I don't know, maybe about six, eight years ago, there was a lot of talk about, you know, people coming back from, from Iraq and Afghanistan with PTSD and, and the kinds of problems that they were having. And I was listening to a program on Kojanambi or something and it just hit me and I just thought, well, they need a family of artists. That's what they need. Right. And um, so I came up with this idea and, and made up a proposal for a program for veterans and their families um, that would, after I moved here, I, I, I ran art studios for a while. So I had seven years of running art studios as well as the kids program. So I thought what they need is a, a program like a family of artists, but, but where veterans could get art studios for free and their families could come and take classes and the studios would be available 24 hours a day. And there would, and other artists could have studios there if they were willing to work with the veterans. And so I had this like really big program and I was encouraged by, um, Art Space, and which is a national program that does art studios all over, and um, all kinds of people to pursue it. And um, I went to Americans for the Arts in Nashville, and I was going to pursue it and talk to the people who were doing veterans programs. Um, but then I, my husband was sick, and I just, I thought, I can't do this. And maybe I know how to do it. I feel guilty not doing it, but I can't. So I hope you do. Uh, I hope you do. Yeah, well, I have the proposal and I keep passing it around to everyone, hoping someone will pick it up and do it, like some 40 somethings that want to do it. And I can consult, but um I think at this point in my life anyway, I it, it was 80 hours a week when I was doing it before, and I don't have 80 hours a week right now. But um, but it's amazing what you can do with with art and and how healing art is. Um, and, uh, you know, there were lots of kids in our program for 10 years that were, were the proof of it. Um, so and I encourage, I gave it to create, I gave it to Wheaton Arts Parade. Um, I've passed it around to a lot of different people and made it, made it available and said, here, do this, do this. So, uh, my husband said, somebody's going to steal that. And I said, good, that's what I want someone to do. So. Great. If you know anybody you. who wants to steal it, I've got the proposal. They can, they can. Uh, real use. talk, real talk. <laughs> yeah. So. Hey, we have a question for now from Grace. Yeah, and I have a funny little question, but before I ask the question, uh, and she dropped off, um, I wanted to comment on two things. One is the woman who I think just went away said, how did that schooling go? And this was very long ago, and I think it may have been only preschool, but my cousin, who's there you are, who's now unfortunately deceased, but somehow I forget the story, but she had a preschool or early grade school that was like that. And it just kind of happened. Maybe she had the one population and she needed the other, but it was, they were all together and it wasn't clear, you know, there was no need to differentiate. And this went on for a very long time and it was very successful. So I would just say um, to you, it's a different model and it was long ago, but it was, it, you know, it was gorgeous. It was just gorgeous. And Magic. I can give you a name. She, she, it may be, it should be written about somewhere, but, but that it went on for a long time. About the first seven years, the pre, the for Center for Rural Pennsylvania asked me to write a book about the first seven years of a family of artists. And I've been, going to write one about the the Medicaid years um it was hard it was hard to deal with it for a long time after after the you know we had a different governor come in and they got rid of Medicaid and 
They, they wanted us to clone the program. I was in the process of cloning it in Philadelphia at the time. And then they cut our Medicaid money and they said, no, but hold on, hold on. We want hold on. Um, and you know, keep it, keep it open, which we tried to do, which was disastrous. So it was tough. It was tough to get over it. But now uh, it's mostly, you know, it's mostly the good memories and 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 how wonderful it was. But when Developmental Disabilities Planning Council, when I told them that we were that they wanted us to go Medicaid, they were like, "Don't do it! Don't do it!" Um, and you know, uh, it was great until it wasn't great, and it was the day. right. It was phenomenal. We went from serving fifteen kids to serving, you know, sixty, eighty kids, and we went from having a couple artists just working on weekends to having 28 full time. And, you know, it was 28, it was, that was counselors and artists, but they were all artists. And um, that's why it was With called. The word Planet unsustainable Planet. comes to mind. Yeah. Um, then the next topic I'd just like to talk about briefly is this uh, veterans family center kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine who actually I'm overdue to be in touch with, um, did some work and was looking to create a program. And what I'd like to do is, you know, not here, but maybe, you know, check her status and check maybe between the two of you. She's also more our age than a younger age. Um, and, and all, but she's she's a lovely person and um does wonderful work. And um at least to talk and see and maybe, you know, maybe one more person in the mix could uh, yeah. help something happen. So I would do the proposal and their first reaction is like, oh my God, that's huge. That's way too big. But I was told that that's actually why it would get funded. Right. Um, that there's money for big things. You yeah, know, hers. Big things. But, and they were actually talking about Department of Defense money. Yes, uh, yes. And there's so much, there's so much uh, recognition more, I think, and so much need that I think that that could be a juicy uh, avenue to turn to. So, so just, you know, I'd look to communicate with you off and maybe. They, put yeah. You they wanted me to do it at the old, um, what's the name of the hot the military hospital? I can never say the Walter name. Reed? Walter Reed at the old Walter Reed. Um, actually George Coke, who started automatic and stuff. He asked me about doing it at the old Walter Reed. Uh, and that's where I thought about doing it. And, um, that's where she but, was kind of plugging into. Yeah, uh, and looking for funders, they said, you know, the the which blah blah blah. We'll talk about it. Yeah. This is a very weird question, and you may have answered it when you talked about taking your paintings and then the coloring book thing and, and going to digital and then going back to painting. But those line drawings are so lovely. And mm -hmm. my question was, uh, did you draw those by hand or did you have either by tracing or digital, did you take your paintings or take your photos or take something and forgive me, but um, trace or some other way than- Yeah, in Photoshop and Illustrator actually have these automatic trace things, but they're not very good where they will trace things for you. But um, I have, and I have had for years and years and years, a Wacom tablet. Um, and so- um, Basically, and what what I said before about simplifying, simplify, simplify, simplify the photograph yeah. and get just get rid of everything that's not important. Um, so using the in in like the photograph, my photograph is on one layer. Right. And I put a layer on top of it, and um, using the the Wacom tablet and the paintbrush tool, I I do the line drawing based on the photograph or parts of the photograph and sometimes multiple photographs that I collage right, together. Right. And then um, and then I'll, maybe I'll put another layer on it to, to do the color. Um, and so what I end up having is from that like group of paintings that I just started doing maybe 10, 15 years ago, I'll have the black and white line drawing and then I'll have the color version. And then if I like it, I'll have the canvas version right right and right. what i usually do is i don't i very rarely go back to the photograph the the canvas version is based but on it's the migrated last, already yeah it's all it's based on the last digital version and it also and, and it also changes a lot just because the medium is different right right so right. um and Thank that's where you. the color field thing comes in because there's right. layer upon layer when i change my mind <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that mm -hmm. 
And um, thank you for the presentation. And Lisa, thank you for uh, hosting as usual and creating this whole wonderful thing that you do. Um, but yeah, thank Lisa, you, Jamie. Thank you. Just uh, delightful to be present. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thank you for coming. And we have a question or comment from Patrick DiCaprio. And someone, oh, by the way, uh, Jamie, someone asked about Hi, your Patrick. Dress. Your best Patrick contact. was in a family of artists, and he's an amazing <laughs> artist. Um, and he was in the he was in the arts alternative high school. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. So they're, they're, I they they I, I miss you. And Hi. I I can't I can't speak enough for how much programs like that have changed so many different people. And even the last time I saw you in person, I told you that same thing recently as of today and even a couple of days ago even family of artists comes up into conversation um and we've been working on a program yeah i'm so excited about that i hope you do it even looking as far as prices for leasing and actual philadelphia money. right somewhere between philadelphia and like the Baltimore, like that mm. angle. So somewhere in there. But. Oh, I, I so hope you do it. And you know, a lot of your fellow family of artists people keep saying they want to do it. And I yeah. wish they would, and maybe they can help you. I mean, I was I always thought PJ would start one. Um, and I know there were a number of people that were like, I'm gonna do this someday. Doris, um, you know. Doris is I I emailed Doris. And uh, she's got a pretty good thing going with the Arts Council. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she said if there was any way she could help, she would. Well, you know. I think people who have, ex my husband used to say this about open classroom back in the day when that was new, that people, pe people could teach open classroom if they'd experienced open classroom. And I think people can, the best people to do something like a family of artists are people who have experienced it because the philosophy was totally it's important. The, there were a couple of people who wanted to take it over when we had to close and we debated about it. And Diana Shanley and I just said, no, they'd ruin it. They can't do it. The, the public, the schools, the intermediate unit wanted to, wanted to take over the program and a couple of other places wanted to take over the program and they just didn't get it. They didn't get During, the philosophy. So um, it's really important. That's so organic into something clinical. It, yeah. It would have just been school. Yeah. And, you no know, people kept saying to us, actions have consequences. You really need to, you need to give these people consequences when they do something. But we were all about positive reinforcement. And uh, it just, it's I, a different animal. It's, it's, and it, that's why it worked. I can't think of, ever seeing an actual problem there other than arguments but that's arguments yeah no but, uh, yeah I want to make sure i said hi and let you know that and patrick's photography there. is amazing and you should go check out his site and i could never do my photography is a totally different thing than patrick's and he and he did a lot of photography at a family of artists and and he did yeah. tell them what you do because it's it's really interesting like Especially the stuff that you do with the telescope and uh, I do it's a mix of everything from near microscopic to astrophotography yeah, yeah. and everything in between. Um the only thing I haven't gotten into is underwater. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I'm scared <laughs> because it's so much. <laughs> the stuff that he does with the telescope and then multiple computer programs and many, many, many layers are, they're just, they're beautiful. They're really 12 beautiful. To 20 hours of exposure, hundreds of photos stacked, mm -hmm. hundreds of gigs of information stacked into one picture. Yeah, yeah. and you have a fantastic eye. So, you know, you're your photographs of the of um Ricketts Glen State Park and stuff are just they're great. One of my Sorry, this turned into a, like a, a you know praising Patrick. He's just he's just so good. So you should Google him and and see his see his stuff. I appreciate that. Coming from you, it means the world. Oh. But um 
One thing that I wanted to get your opinion on, moving, you said digital art is difficult still in a gallery. Mm, well, I guess if it's, if it's identified as photography, it's not. But when it's identified as painting, people seem to be hesitant. I've I been shoveling. Cheating. I think they think it's, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> what What's your thought? People don't want an inkjet print. So I've mm. actually have reverted to trying to figure out how to print a negative and then do it in the dark room. Mm. Digital. But I've been I've been struggling. I was wondering if you had an insight on that or a thought about it. I hadn't thought about it, but I guess there's no reason why you couldn't do it. If you, what do you print on acetate and make a negative? Yeah. And then so you could do silk screen, you could do silk screen from it too. Um, I mean, I can, I can silk screen. Yeah. You could silk screen from it, from the acetate. I've been painting on acetate, which I didn't show because I'm not happy with them yet, but I did a whole series of paintings on acetate that I called Growing Up Pennsylvania, but I changed my mind about them. They're not, I'm not happy with them yet. And I've changed my attitudes about Pennsylvania. It went from being nostalgic to being, you know, related to opioids and politics. And I didn't have the same feeling about it, but, but working yeah. on acetate is neat, but I, I have done some printing on acetate, but I haven't done it for a long, long time. Um, it's almost like that that uh, slide film, like how we used to put the slides in the projectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I think of when when you're saying you know printing. Or no, painting. you're 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 much more technically oriented than I am. I you know my photography is, you know, I did it as a photojournalist and I do it as a process towards a painting. Um, but and yours is is like pure fine art photography and very technically That's oriented really so um yeah I don't know I, I have to think about that anybody else have any ideas about how you could go from digital to darkroom it's or just in a gallery in general I've that's what I've been struggling with because nobody wants an inkjet print I just sent a thing in the messages um, and I don't know about this where just um, my husband is what he calls himself a Luddite, but years ago, like maybe 20 years ago, he um, he had done, he does a lot of hand work, maybe 16 by 20 on paper. And he got them up at the Kinkies, a, a great big scanner, huge, huge, because we have them there about three by four, or four by five that they printed. And then he had a series and the friend wanted the series. So he gave away the originals but he had them scanned before. So I don't know if at that point you could go to a negative somehow, but the giant scanners these days may have may have the quality that you're thinking about. It's just something to think about and an avenue to maybe well, go down and find the next thing. I do it myself because I'm cheap on the Epson printer, Epson printer, but you can, I mean, if you have G clays made by people that have the thousands of dollars of Epson printers with so many more colors and stuff uh, and have G clays printed, I find that they're more acceptable to people, even though they're still the same thing. Um, I'm and well, sitting, right, sitting right there. Oh, you've got the big Epson printer? Oh, how nice. the, cannon. the prints are gorgeous. But they're expensive and they're expensive to maintain. And But anyway, um, so, I mean, that's more acceptable, even though it is a, an inkjet print. Um, and then sometimes people print G clays and then paint on top of them mm -hmm. um, as part of their process. And there's an illustrator that does comic book covers and she does that. She like, it's it's printing and painting and then printing and then painting, you know, uh, as a process. Um, and she does like, I, I forget her name. She lives in, she lives in Illinois, she lives in Chicago. And she does, um, you know, Marvel comic kinds of covers. And she does a combination of the two. I think in graphic design, it's probably more accepted than it is in studio art right now. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I didn't think about the fact that they didn't like what well, there's these new printers too that are more heat generate. I don't know what those are. I was looking at them, but 
sub die some something okay. like that yeah i know yeah i don't know you'll probably figure it out someday <laughs> <laughs> it was well, great luck, to see you good luck with your program maybe if it's in baltimore some of the people from down here can uh that are oh, you'll hear more. maxwell says he's on board i would love to see Max. i haven't seen him in so long he's there he's up near you yeah he invited me to the Delaware Water Gap to the drum festival and I was away. It was mm. so sad. So one of these days, well, we'll all have to get together. He's, Maybe uh, I was talking about Maxwell before that I had that Ancestors and River Rock show. He's from, he's from Ghana, mm. an amazing artist. And he taught at a family of artists for many His years. Wood carving was amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. We did so many different things there. Like we could just go and make paper and then go paint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then go make a metal sculpture and then yeah. Build the frame and, and all of it. Yeah. It was great. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad I experienced it and I'm over the trauma now. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so I can just think about the good stuff. But um, Thank you so much for your talk. Tell John I said hello. I will. Tell him to stop hurting himself and going to the hospital. I will. <laughs> Visit if you're ever in town. I will. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Patrick from Philadelphia. You're welcome, Close. actually. Poconos. Poconos. Yep. Close Milk enough. Down or right in the Poconos? Um, well, I was in Stroudsburg. Now I'm up by Wilkes-Barre. So. Okay, because I know Milltown. Uh, you will find him on his bicycle almost anywhere, though. He must put in hundreds of miles on his bicycle. Oh, keep going. I'm, I'm into oh. the hundreds per ride. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Even driving a car that far is tiring. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, great. And taking photographs all along the way. That's the hard part. That's great. Okay, well, thanks for joining us, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, we have time for another question or two. I know we have an art, a local Silver Spring artist. Donna Reinsell is with us. Hi, everybody. Oh, let I me bring I to get to know all of these local artists. I'm, I haven't and, gotten, I don't get out much these days, but someday. Dawn is new in, in Silver Spring. Tell us about yourself, Donna. I just got acquainted with her yesterday. Yeah, we talked for a while yesterday. It was really nice. Um, I moved here um, from Virginia and before that Baltimore for a long time. Um, and I moved to Art Space Silver Spring, which is at 801 Sligo mm -hmm. um, in kind of in the Art downtown Space area. Organization. Yeah, yeah. So um i just wanted to say we're having a quarterly art show that i host uh four times a year here at art space on saturday from one to five and we have 14 artists who are gonna some people have tables with like jewelry and i'll have jewelry are, are they resident artists um about half of them are um some are actually the um artists who are waiting for the commercial studios to open there are a few of them and then my sister who lives near here and um a couple other of my my students and nice i guess that's it yeah i teach I at the art, art space is pardon me i'm wondering if people know what art space is it's it's a i, I can explain it really quick it's a national organization they have about at least 50 properties all around the country and um it's like affordable housing for artists is what it is. We in at this place, we we are a little bit special because of two things. We have a really nice um, lobby gallery, and we also have those commercial studios, which no other art spaces have that um, that are going to be rented to um, just local artists. But and I I am the only resident here who is getting one of those because. Um, our apartments are really nice. It would work if you were a painter or a musician, but I do metal work 
So I need, you know, a space where I can do that. So I'm going to get one of those when they open. Their model is amazing. And correct me if I get any of this wrong, but um, I was working with them for a while and actually they were encouraging the veterans program. But um, what they do is that they, um, they get a bank or somebody else, somebody like that to purchase a building for the tax credits. And that's why it's affordable housing because there are tax credits available. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so the building is basically free. So all the artists have to cover is the renovations. So the studios are built and that's why they're, they're relatively inexpensive. And, and you have to be an artist to be there. I was, a, I juried for the Brentwood one. Um, oh. Wasn't really jurying. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't judging the val the quality of the art. It was judging whether or not the person is really an artist because you know, they might, somebody might want the space and, um, and because it was expensive, inexpensive, wonderful space. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and also about whether or not they would be a, like a good neighbor, um, you know, how they would deal with a drummer living next door or something like that. But it, it's an amazing program and it's a wonderful thing to offer artists affordable live workspace, beautiful space. It's mostly like, I don't, the one in Brentwood is like mostly studio with like a bedroom and a kitchen right yeah ours are a large like you I guess you could say living room but the kitchen is along one wall so it's like a really big studio um apartment but my son lives here with me too so we have two bedrooms as well mm -hmm. um, but the spaces are beautiful the ceilings are like nine feet high and the windows go up to the ceilings and you know we have a, we have a balcony um which is really great too some allow pets, I guess, right? Yeah, we're allowed pets. Yeah, uh, they're great. So if you're a, if you're an artist and you qualify and you want to live in a place like that, it's a it's a wonderful thing. Except there are long yeah. waiting lists for them all. I'm sorry, what did you say? Except there are long waiting lists for them usually. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, it's worked out really qualify. well. You can qualify as an artist in various ways um as a writer for example or even an arts mm -hmm. um cultural programmer yeah mm -hmm. um, i know there's the, uh, one person who lives here um teaches or directs at um mm -hmm. i'm sure you know what this is it's a, a it's a Five venue feet. for plays that kids do it's in downtown silver spring oh, lumina yeah. theater lumina uh, maybe that's it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she teaches there and that qualified her. Mm -hmm. um, I think she does artwork too, but things like that work. Um, it was mm -hmm. an, when, when I did the interviews, it was me and a couple of other people. It was, uh, it was fascinating to meet the people who came, you know, all different kinds of artists. Yes. There's a wide variety of artists here too. And um, tell us about the event you have this Saturday, Donna. Okay. Um, it's in our lobby gallery, um, 801 Sligo, and it's right, it's just like a half block off Fenton. Um, and yeah, there are 14 of us, all different media. We have um, some artists you all might have heard of, like uh, Shelly Saren is a potter, and Lauren Lay is in the show. Um, as I said, residents and a couple of friends too. Leslie so um, Leslie Ann Hansley. Yeah, she's in it. Oh, okay. yep. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the three of them are waiting for studios here. Mm -hmm. So that's why I invite I invited everybody who's waiting for a studio. How long um, is the waiting list now? To get in here? I don't know. Mm. <laughs> I really don't. Um probably pretty long, I would think. I imagine. Yeah, so another pardon me time to build another time to build another yeah. Um, so our show will it's some artists have tables and then others have their work on the walls. some have both. And yeah, you can just come in and just walk around and meet people and if you see anything you know you like you could buy it, but um, mostly it's to show the work and show off the space too. It's a beautiful space. And that's this Saturday, one to five at the art space at, what's the address? 801 Sligo. Okay, great. Very good. 
following Saturday, Jamie's hosting one, which we'll say again. Not this Saturday. Ours is the 18th. Oh, two Saturdays after. Yeah. Well, that soon. Yeah. Yeah. I hope to see you all there. Yeah, I'm planning to go. Is it? It's 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 on Facebook and I you saw it. One one seven one. Oh well. Oh, yours. 118. Yeah. Okay. One one seven one three Hatcher Place. It's North Kensington, basically. Okay. Oh, um, someone is asking, what is the rent of the studio space? What is the rent? Um, it's Don't about um, twenty one dollars a foot. Oh, $21 so a dollars. foot per year. Per year. Does that, that you know how they, um, per month. they charge for commercial space differently from residential? So right. it depends on obviously how many square feet you have. I think the studios, though, some are really small, some are a lot bigger. I think they're running between maybe 350 to Mm -hmm. a thousand i don't know that's amazing it's i'm just cool. guessing that that's amazing yeah I, I thought they were around a thousand for for most mm -hmm. of them but but they, they you have smaller spaces too that are only like 350 wow i think so what um, i'm i yeah i think that some studio, of the spaces around here and that was just a studio not a studio not a live workspace you know yeah that's just a, now you can't get a studio oh no no that's for the commercial studios what i'm talking about oh the commercial studios that's really good price yeah i mean the, the if you paid that it would probably if you paid 350 it probably wouldn't be all you know very big yeah there are some really there's at least one really nice studio there but i'm excited about it because um all i have to do is take the elevator downstairs and my studio will be there are the are the apartments the live workspaces are they still around a thousand or are they more than that now um well it depends but i pay more than that but i have a two-bedroom mm -hmm. and it also is de um depends on income too right and we have some vets who have reduced income and it, it depends on your income the vets i think get a some kind of a special situation um but yeah i think it's it's less than it would be at another apartment here okay so. well we'll see you on saturday at the art arts um what is it called the name of the place art space art space silver Spring art space, space. And do they have a nonprofit that like usually they turn it over to a nonprofit to manage, right? Have they no, that's a profit, it's a for-profit management. Company. Oh, this is a for-profit management. It's CT group. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I went to a lot of the early some of the early meetings for it several years ago, and they kind of have a nonprofit ethos, I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, they're very considerate of the needs of artists and mm -hmm. other creatives so yeah. yeah it's it's great to see that it's finally happening it was yeah. delayed, you know with COVID it was delayed mm -hmm. um, right things were delayed but you were able to move in right before COVID we moved in um in January 21 oh 21 and okay. we were the we were only the fourth people to right. sign a lease so uh, nobody moved in Okay. Yeah. Everything was delayed then. As I yeah, thought. everything was delayed. And um, it took us a little while to get our events committee together. I mean, we're still kind of working on that to, to start doing events in the, in the lobby in other spaces. We have other space, smaller spaces here. You can do things. All right. Well, I'll plan to make it by this Saturday between one and five. Yeah. Thank you, Donna. Great to see you. Great and to see you. Yeah, great. Yeah. We'll see you in person on Saturday. Great. I'm glad you can do it. Thank you. And thank you so much, Jamie. Just if you want to tell us as we close what your current projects are, and also be sure to give us a few more details about your event on the 18th of December. Um, well, let's see. Um current projects. I don't know. I I uh We'll see what happens when I'm on break. There's there's the 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 sandwich board I'm working on for the event on the 18th of of December. Like I said there are five of us, I think, unless somebody else wants to join. 
Uh, my house isn't that big, but we'll, we, you know, the more the merrier. And um, we'll have Christmas ornaments and all kinds of stuff. Um, and, you know, art, artwork, probably more affordable, smaller stuff um, and um, goodies. And we'll have a party and we'll see who shows up. Um, and that, I think that'll be fun. I mean, it's the first time we've tried. I know in Tacoma Park, the artists do that all over the place. Different different artists get together the, during the holidays and four or five artists in somebody's mm -hmm. house. And, um, but to my knowledge, we we haven't, well, there was one big show in Kensington, I guess, a couple of years ago. It was outdoor, indoor, and one of the big Victorians. Um, but, you know, why not? We'll see what happens here. We're trying to build community. We want to have artist coffees and full moon parties and stuff like that. So we used to do full moon parties in the Poconos that just if you're an artist, you're invited and, you know, potluck or five bucks or something and all kinds of people met each other. And I keep trying to convince people to do that here. And I think we're, we're talking about it. Plus just artist coffees getting together in each other's studios and things. And um, so, you know, this is, this is an attempt to have sort of a community get together right. and excuse a holiday sale is an excuse. Right. That's great. And I, and I know, is, I think I'm going to be working on Brookside garden stuff. I suspect. Oh, I know we were just That'd there be. for, we had an event there with our sparkle program, our senior mm. program. Um, but I wanted to mention for anyone along the creative spectrum, we host quarterly art salons. So that is all about building community, also sharing ideas. So our next art salon is, I believe, January 12th. I put it in the chat. I put a lot of things in the chat. Okay. And assisted by um, artists. And your newsletter. Support. Your newsletter is coming out tomorrow, right? So it'll be in that. Right. And our December newsletter is coming out. So I can include the flyer for your December 18th event. And um I'll be just heading west to California for the holidays, mm. home to San Diego. So otherwise I would be there too. So you'll oh, have to organize yeah, more things in 2023 at home, at your home and uh, find a chance for us to meet again and find it, um, you know, share with, with us what you're doing, you know, more. I want to see more of your animal work. For inviting, yeah, I may do animals. Thanks for inviting me. I, uh, I, I really enjoyed the last time you invited me to that panel discussion. That was so much fun. And I meant to follow up with all the people that were in it because they were so fascinating. And like I said, I haven't been getting out much, but I still intend to. So um, right. you, you have connections with so many wonderful artists that, and there are so many here. There are, we're very fortunate to be connected to so many creative folks. So well, thank you again so much, Jamie, Jamie Downs, and um, we love your art and look forward to seeing more of it. Well, thanks. Thank thanks you for having me. For joining Bye. us. Thank you, friends. We hope to see you on um, Thursday for uh, Top of the Pops with artist David Amoroso. Stuff is so much fun.